chapter. This is a series of videos on generational issues in the church, and there's a lot of issues <laughs> in churches overall, uh, but I think as far as what we deal with on a regular basis, one of the biggest divides that we have to recognize and work actively to kind of uh, meet the needs of people where they're at different places uh, are these kind of differences could be our cultural differences right and so anytime you have one culture intersecting and interacting with another culture there's going to be uh, there's going to be some tension and there's going to be some kind of uh, language and communication and effort that needs to happen in order to make things be able to for those two separate groups to work together and so that's a key uh, that we will see kind of in the next video um, as we kind of work towards solutions and kind of like the steps forward uh, so the first video was a kind of a primer an introduction to why this is important uh, in this video I'm going to share a little bit about the different generations that exist in the church today and some of the hallmarks and main beliefs and value systems that they're bringing to church and why there is some disagreement and why there is some misunderstanding. So we'll just kind of give an overview of the current state of the church and the different generations that exist in the church today and uh, what that looks like. When we're talking about church in America in 2021, we're looking at it being made up of five different generations. So we're talking about cultures clashing. We're talking about not just one group coming together with another group, but five different ways of looking into the world, looking at God, understanding scripture, all those things. So uh, if we kind of go back to World War II, and so you're kind of like the late 30s, early 40s, and you've got a lot of men, a lot of men that are away off to war and in this situation then you've got a lot of the women that are back home that had been rural are moving now to the cities to work in the factories to produce the goods that are needed uh, to support the troops overseas and the people at home all right so you've got these these women that have moved uh, they're not only moving to the city and then going to a job they're also going to a church because well if your man is over there you want to support him not just with goods but with prayer right and so uh, not that these people weren't necessarily religious before uh, but you see a rise of an urban church an urban uh, female centered female focused church because if you are a church you want to reach out to people who you're gonna reach out to you're gonna reach out to the women right because that's who's there uh, and so that kind of that's that's going to put a spin on how church is going to look like for a, a long time um, and uh, and so now these guys, they're, they're coming home from war. They've seen terrible things. They've done terrible things. They're definitely processing those things. And one of those, they could process it. And maybe a way that would be helpful to them would be to go to church. Now, uh, these people understood that there was a lot of power in organization. And what did they see is they saw when an organized effort came together, even different countries working together, then there was this evil in the world that they could work together to extinguish or defeat, right? And so there was a trust in an organization and there was a trust in an expert, right? So the different leaders, worldwide leaders that kind of spoke into the situations uh, gave a lot of wisdom. And even at home, uh, there was the rise of mass marketing and things like that, where it was like, here, this very important person has, like the Surgeon General says, you know, kind of thing. And so there's trust in that. And so when that translates over into church life, there's trust in kind of the authority can be a trusted thing. The organization can be a trusted place. And so that was kind of bred into the idea of church. What is church? Church is an organization that we can trust, right? That we want to be a part of, that we want to raise our families in this organization. And that is exactly then what they tried to do is raise their kids in the church. All right. Uh, what are the hallmarks then? How, how is Christianity measured then within the organization that we should be devoted to? Uh, these are values that would be had, right? Devotion, loyalty, um, respect, 
would be values of that generation of that builder generation and the way that you show that you're really into this and that you are really a faithful Christian is attendance right you show up so that is a, a huge hallmark of this generation is one major way that you show your support to the Christian organization and to the church is by being there right you show up when the church doors are open you're there you also give regularly Right, so tithing, giving a percentage of your paycheck, and giving that to the organization that you can trust is going to be an important thing. And having right doctrine is important. So as churches grew and grew, uh, how do you differentiate and know uh, you're going to go to church? So which church you go to? And the church that you went to would essentially be the one that was teaching the right things. And so that there's a high priority placed on that. All right, um, so rules were important, doctrine was important, loyalty was important. So then their kids are raised in the church. And when you're raised in the church, that's not necessarily an evil thing, but it is different than being raised in Christ. So that you have a generation of kids that are raised up, the boomers, in the organization, right? And kind of uh, just not, not just navigating religion and doctrine and faith, but navigating the organization. Now, the boomers... Uh, were so big and powerful that eventually they, they would come to be in charge of everything. Right? The boomers were also highly valued work and were going to, you know, they were the ones that created the 50 hour work week or the 60 hour work week. And so they put a lot of emphasis on working. Right? And so what did they see with work and what did they highly value it was not just duty and commitment and loyalty to an organization where their parents may have worked for the same company for 50 or 60 years, uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to get ahead. They wanted to have success. So you put the hours in if it's going to be successful. And so then when you come back to your church organization, what do you want for your church organization? You want the decisions to be made and the things to be done for your church to be successful. And what does successful look like? That means that your church is bigger. Like you, your parents didn't care about the size of the building, but now there is an emphasis on we want bigger buildings, we want better programs, we want more people, right? And not necessarily for pure and holy reasons, although I'm not saying that they were devoid of those ideas, uh, that, but the value was, I want to be a part of something that's successful. And so that was bred into how we saw church. What should church look like? We should take some of the same principles that we see in the business world that are working in businesses, that are growing and sustaining businesses, and we can kind of breathe those into our churches. Well, the next generation that comes up, Generation X, is kind of anti that. You can kind of see how each, each generation isn't going to grab a little bit from what the generation before them was doing and borrow from that, but then also reject some of that. So uh, Generation X is... Uh, you know, success will success is not necessarily about how big you are and how big your building is, um, but it's about the quality of relationships. Like, uh, so you have a generation that uh, a couple of things are happening. Uh, a generation that starts to really fade from church. Okay, one of the other things that the boomers did in their drive for success was fade away from some of the right doctrine that was so important. And one of the hallmarks of that generation, of the boomer generation, was a very high divorce rate. So you've got Gen Xers that are growing up in households that are preaching one thing. This is how you need to live. This is what you need to do. This is the right thing. This is the right thing. But then living lives that didn't necessarily line up. And so you have Generation X kids that in a lot of ways left the church, right? So their parents were raised in the church and then when you're raised in the church in the second generation and you have these questions, well, why do we do this or why are we doing that? Now your parents don't really have good answers and you kind of see them as hypocrites. Uh, so a lot of people just left the church altogether. Those who stayed highly valued authenticity. So that is like when you read different like books about church stuff it's like there's this whole wave of church stuff that's all following what what the marketplace is doing and then a whole new wave of church stuff that is more about how can we be authentic and that was kind of the catchphrase of gen xers is wanting authenticity right like it doesn't matter 
what we really want is just go to a place that's real, with real people who are, who are, that are actually trying to live out their faith. It doesn't matter if it's big and flashy, I just want it to be real. And, uh, and so we kind of saw different expressions of the church kind of popping up here and there in different places, but that was the value of that. Now, I'm also kind of showing how not are just things changing, but there's also kind of a, a slow uh, fading away from biblical ideals and the Bible and a perception of how people are reading the Bible. Uh, because another shift that's happening in this time is a shift away from biology as being the dominant science that kind of dictated and either competed against faith or supported faith. Um, you know, so there's like the the arguments with creation versus evolution and things like that. Uh, but also that was, that was kind of how we saw the world and the scientific method, you know, and kind of like we can test things and we can approve things. And, and that's how we saw the Bible, right? We looked at scriptures and said, okay, we can test them and we can prove them. Well, the shift of the dominant science goes from being biology that kind of uh, influenced our worldview to psychology. It's not just about, if you can prove it, but it's uh, what's what's making people tick, what's making people think the way they do, what's making people behave the way they behave, and let's try to understand that. And and so this shift kind of goes along with a postmodern worldview of truth is not just a one firm truth that everyone has the same truth, and you have to kind of conform to that truth or understand that truth. But what's true for you and to you uh, might be different from my perspective, right? And my understanding and, and how I was raised. And so we see this shift and that's going to inform uh, a whole new generation of how they look at things and how they perceive things, and how they understand things. And so when we get to the Bible and say the millennials, uh, now looking at the Bible is less about this is a book that gives us truth and more of an experiment of, is this a book that provides a truth that works for me? All right, so the questions and the approach has changed um, because church itself then becomes uh, part of that questioning, right? So it's, um, uh, so let's say, let's say the gen Generation X is in the church and they're starting to look at the practices of church and questioning them. Why do we do this? Is this fruitful? Should we do this? Is this genuine? Is this authentic? Where millennials started to look at church itself. Should we even go to church? Like, you're questioning all of the things that the church does. Maybe we shouldn't even go to church. And uh, in one study, they even found that one, when millennials were asked about connecting with God and being able to connect with God, they reported that they felt like they could connect with God better outside of the realm of church than within the realm of church. And so there, there's that kind of questioning and feeling like, do I even need this? Do I need to show up in some place on Sunday morning and meet with a group of people to connect with God? I feel like I can connect with God better elsewhere. And so you also see a shift from kind of a communal duty and responsibility to one another to now looking out for myself. Is this working for me? Is this what I need? There's also the practicality of, you guys told me I should live this way and do things this way. But you didn't always do that, A, the hypocrite argument. And it's not that you just didn't always do it, but you also kind of expressed to us that if we did it this way, that would bring a certain amount of joy to our lives. And yet when we look at you and make quick judgments on you, boomers and builders, you tend to be a people that when we connect you with church, we see joylessness. We see anger, we see frustration, we hear your complaints about the other people in the church. All right, and so this kind of, and even then some of the practical things like, hey, you should wait to, don't move in with each other until you're married. Don't have sex until you're married. All right, now the, these, are, these are good things. I'm not arguing, I'm just saying this is the general perception would be, well, that's what you did and you still got divorced 50% of the time. So, um, so it's kind of ex-Bible truths. I'm trying to see, is this working for me? I'm looking at your life and saying, it didn't really work for you. Or 
if you really believed it, it didn't seem like you really believed it enough to live it out. And so all of this judgment of previous generations in there, how they did church, how they read the Bible, okay? So they, there's just so many layers here. Plus, millennials are also now a couple of generations removed from a church that by and large in America, not every expression of church, but by and large, so many churches were still operating in a model that was set up 50 years before they were born. Right? A model of church that was set up to uh, be attractive to women who had moved to the city, who were working in factories, and were looking for a place to pray and get involved while their husbands were off to war. Right? The same way that church was being done in the 1940s is still how a lot of churches were doing church in the 1990s and 2000s. And so you can understand that uh, as things kind of shift a little bit, that it's still the general same model to attract those people. Uh, so a church that might be set up to attract a 35-year-old woman in, the 19, in 1942 might not attract a 20-year-old male in 2002 or 2022. Uh, so uh, just some of the issues that might exist there. All right, so... Uh, and we can see just uh, some of the changing ideals, some of the changing foundational thoughts about truth. And what we have then is in 2021, churches that exist that have all of these different cultures uh, that are trying to get along uh, with different foundational worldviews, different ideas about what truth is, that's going to affect how we look at and read the Bible and how we understand scriptures and how scripture should be interpreted that's also going to affect what we think the church should be should the church be an organization that meets that supports one another or should the church be an organism that uh, that is authentic and supports relationships or should the church be a society a group of people that are following jesus and should have an impact in the world through service and charity and so the, the, we kind of see the, the predominant view of what the church should be starts to shift. When you get all of those different camps in the same room thinking this is what it should be, and this is what the Bible is, and this is how we should understand it, and this is how worship should be, and this is what worship should look like. You can see a difference in songs that were written in the 30s and 40s and 50s were more about encouraging one another and, uh, and with the word and about encouraging the church. Uh, praise songs that are written in the 80s and 90s and 2000s are more about talking directly to God, right? Uh, and so, so we see see a shift in how we do things. Now, um, that's just a lot of information and just very surface level. But even with this, I think that we get a good idea of what we're dealing with and why this is so important. Why we can't just look at a different generation and say, well, you are going about it wrong or you're thinking about it in the wrong way. You've got bad ideas. We can't just wholesale dismiss each other. Um, what we need to do is have good dialogue and be good listeners. So that's what we're going to address in the next couple of videos is our path forward. If we're in churches and there's so much uh, different idea and different uh, I, ways to think about all of these religious things, God and his Bible and truth and the church, um, how can we get along how can we move forward together without alienated, alienating whole generations? So I hope that you're interested in it. I hope that there's part of you that feels like, yes, I feel this strain. Like I feel like I go to church and it's not necessarily speaking to me. And, and maybe this is part of what's going on. And maybe when we talk about a path forward, that can be answers that you can use in your church and that we in Utica can use uh, in our church for helping us move along.